In this unit, we're going to start looking at the alkanes and cycloalkanes, which are saturated hydrocarbons. Now, these at first glance look like pretty boring compounds because they're just made of carbon and hydrogen, and they just contain carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen single bonds. There's things like hexane, cyclohexane, and related compounds with different numbers of, of carbons, and there can be branching and all kinds of things like this. So while there's a good bit of structural diversity here, there's not a lot of exciting things going on. No heteroatoms, no functional groups aside from alkanes to speak of. However, it's a good context to introduce, first of all, ideas about nomenclature and how we think about naming and, and really seeing organic compounds as an alkane skeleton decorated by functional groups and conformation, this idea that there's rotation around carbon-carbon single bonds and other types of single bonds in organic molecules. And these are the two big areas of focus for this unit. We're going to introduce alkanes and cycloalkanes, their general structures, and some ideas about nomenclature with a primary focus on being able to see and think about and verbalize molecules in an efficient and useful way. And then we're going to move into talking about conformation. So I've kind of divided up the learning objectives here into two categories. Initially, we're going to start with introducing the alkanes, and these are sort of highlighted in blue. We'll talk about their general structures. We'll touch on isomerism a little bit in the alkanes, which is a big deal as we start to get to five, six, seven carbons and realize there are many, many ways we can arrange, for example, seven or eight carbons in a carbon skeleton. We're going to build familiarity with a systematic naming system for compounds. This will give us the ability to go from a structure drawing to a textual name or vice versa. And there's the idea here of being able to communicate efficiently and effectively using text without having to draw pictures for everything, but also learning to see molecules in the right way, distinguishing between, for example, what we'll call the parent chain, which is kind of like the backbone of the molecule, and what are called the substituents, the groups that are branching off of the backbone or parent chain. And what we're going to do here really is keep it simple. We're not going to get in the weeds on nomenclature, and I don't want you to worry too much about the weeds of nomenclature because there are a lot of exceptions, edge cases, weird structures, different functional groups that you can think about showing up in molecules. We're not going to deal with any of that in this unit, focusing on the basic principles of the IUPAC nomenclature system. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the relative stabilities of alkanes. And again, there's not much going on here if you think about it from the perspective of the stability factors, right? Um, it's all just carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds. But nonetheless, we can use heats of combustion as a measure of stability and look at, for example, the difference in stability between linear and branched alkanes. We'll touch on that. And then we'll move into conformation, the representation and study of arrangements of alkanes and cycloalkanes with respect to rotation around single bonds. And so we're going to learn various ways to represent different conformations, the Newman projection being the one that's most important. This is a representation that focuses on conformation, looking down a bond so that we can see torsion about that bond via rotation of the groups in the front or the back of this projection. We'll then look at the dependence of, of energy on conformation. How does the energy of a molecule change as we rotate about a single bond in the molecule? Focusing first on acyclic conformers, acyclic conformations. Um, and what we'll end up doing, the ultimate goal here, is to construct a conformational potential energy diagram or conformational coordinate diagram for rotation about a particular single bond in an acyclic compound. And we'll learn how to name and, and think about various conformations that show up in acyclic compounds. When it comes to cycloalkanes, we'll focus in on strains, the different structural effects that cause destabilization of certain cycloalkanes. For example, cyclopropane with only three carbons is a highly strained cycloalkane. And we'll learn how to recognize and, and describe those strains. And eventually, we'll focus in on the ultimate cycloalkane when it comes to conformational concerns, the strain-free cyclohexane, which exists in a chair conformer, a shape that resembles a, uh, a lawn chair, as we'll see. We'll learn how to draw these, both cyclohexane itself and substituted cyclohexanes, and we'll distinguish between the two types of positions that show up in these structures. There are two distinct types of substituents with different spatial properties. We'll touch on that.
And we'll look at the relative stabilities of chair conformers. Here again, we're interested in the energetic dependence of conformation in a sense, right? How does the energy of a molecule depend on its conformation and particularly the orientations of substituents in a cyclohexane chair? And then at the end of the unit, we'll touch on common polycyclic carbon skeletons where more than one ring is involved. Let's start with the alkanes. Alkanes are saturated hydrocarbons that contain only carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen single bonds. And they're most commonly found actually in, in crude oil. They're probably the most important constituent of crude oil. Because they're saturated, there's actually a mathematical relationship between the number of carbons in an alkane and the number of hydrogens. For an alkane, for an acyclic alkane with N carbons, there are two N plus two hydrogens. And the names typically end in the suffix ane with the prefix indicating the number of carbons involved. So for example, propane has the formula C3H8, butane has the formula C4H10, and pentane has the formula C5H12. So we see this Cn, H2, and plus 2 pattern in these three linear acyclic alkanes. Now some important general properties of alkanes. First of all, because they don't have any heteroatoms and they pretty much have no polarization to speak of, they're generally low boiling and low melting substances. So propane, for example, is a gas, butane is barely a gas at room temperature, and pentane is a liquid that kind of really, really wants to be a gas at room temperature. And the reasoning here, the idea here, is that the intermolecular forces in these compounds are purely London dispersion, no polarization to speak of. These are nonpolar compounds, and so they have quite weak intermolecular forces and low boiling and melting points as a result. From a reactivity point of view, these don't do much. Um, however, the one thing they do that we're familiar with from everyday life is combustion in the presence of oxygen, right? And this is an important reaction type that generates carbon dioxide and water for the alkanes. Aside from that, generally speaking, they don't do much. Early in the history of organic chemistry, it was typical for compounds to be given names based on their properties, origin, or things like this. And these common names really no bore no systematic relation to one another. So for example here, we have some examples of common names of organic compounds that are still in use today. Formic acid and urea, both of these compounds contain a carbonyl group, but you wouldn't necessarily know that from their names, right? Morphine has a very complex structure, but a very simple name that is not really descriptive at all if we're thinking about the structure itself. And barbituric acid, I mean, this one is, is a nice one. It was named after a woman named Barbara, literally. And this name is still used as a common name to this day. So you'll come across common names of many organic compounds in your studies of, of the field. Um, but it's helpful, it would be helpful to have some systematic way to name compounds. After all, there are millions and millions and millions, countless numbers of organic compounds. And so without a systematic way to name them, it's going to be impossible to come up with a common name for every single known organic compound, right? And that's where the IUPAC nomenclature system comes in. This provides us with a set of conventions and rules for converting a bond line structure, the bond line structures that you see on this slide, for example, into a string of letters, basically a systematic name, a name for the compound. And we can also go in the other direction by sort of applying these rules in reverse. We can start with a name and generate a bond line structure from the name by applying the IUPAC nomenclature conventions in reverse. And the idea here, as we study IUPAC nomenclature, is not to memorize the rules and not to robotically apply these rules, but really to learn to see organic molecules, again, as a saturated hydrocarbon skeleton decorated with functional groups. And the IUPAC nomenclature system is based on this fundamental way of seeing organic compounds. It starts with the root of the name, which is based on the longest contiguous chain of carbon atoms in the compound. This is known as the parent chain. And there are many simple alkanes that have only the parent chain. All of the carbons can be thought of as contained within the parent chain. For example, here, we have a linear chain of carbons, a saturated hydrocarbon with eight carbons in it. And here I've gone ahead and numbered the carbons. This eight carbon linear chain is known as an octane. And without any non-hydrogen groups linked to carbons one through eight, the name of this compound is simply the name of the parent chain, octane. Now in most organic compounds, there will be groups other than hydrogen 
connected to these carbons of the parent chain. And we call these groups that are not hydrogen connected to the parent chain substituents because they substitute for hydrogens in the parent chain. For example, the parent chain of octane might be substituted with a chlorine at carbon five. That chlorine would be called a substituent. So the idea is we start with the parent chain, the parent hydrocarbon, something like butane here. We take one of those H's and we replace it with some general group R. This could be really any atom. Doesn't have to be a carbon group necessarily. That R group is known as a substituent because it substitutes for the H. The location of that substituent is critical for describing the correct isomer of the structure, right? The structure would be different if R was connected here versus here. And so we use what's called a locant number to indicate the position of the R group on the parent chain. And these are the two really big components of an IUPAC systematic name. You've got the root name corresponding to the parent chain and the substituents with their locant numbers typically listed as prefixes before the name of the parent chain. It'll sometimes arise that you'll find that a, a given structure has multiple parent chains of equivalent length. For example, here, if we start here and we count along one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, there are seven carbons in this parent chain highlighted in red, but if we take that same structure and we start over here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, we've got a seven carbon parent chain in this sort of alternative way to see the molecule. And notice the substituents are different. Here I have this three carbon substituent and this two carbon substituent. But in the first way of numbering, I've got three substituents. One, two, three. And so we're left with a question here, parent chains of equal length, how do I decide what to call the parent chain? And the rule here, or the convention is, we're gonna choose the parent chain with the greatest number of substituents. This allows us to essentially avoid complexity in the substituents generally, right? Here, I, there's no branching, for instance, in these substituents, which is kind of nice. It keeps the substituent structure simpler and actually makes things easier to name. So the correct way to go about doing this, in this case, is this one, where we have three substituents, each of which is simpler. You want to avoid doing this, which would lead to only two substituents, but a more structurally complex substituent here, which is harder to name. In talking about the parent chains, each parent chain length is associated with a given prefix. And after four carbons, these get highly intuitive if you're familiar with Greek roots. Pent, hex, hept, oct, etc. And for alkanes, we're going to add ane onto this prefix to generate the name of the parent chain. The first three are a bit esoteric, a bit off the wall. One carbon uses the meth prefix, methane, methyl, for example. Two carbons is the eth prefix with ethane, it's the two carbon hydrocarbon, uh, two carbon alkane, and then um, propane has three carbons. C3H8, for example, is the parent alkane in that case. So these um, Greek prefixes, as well as meth, eth, prop, and bute for the four carbon case, butane is C4H10, are used to name that uh, parent chain. How do we name substituents? Well, for linear substituents without any branching, the idea is we take the name of the parent hydrocarbon with that same number of carbons, we take away the ane of the parent alkane, and we replace that with il, y il. So here, for instance, I've got two carbons in the substituent. The two carbon alkane is ethane. To name the substituent, I'm gonna chop off the ane and replace it with il. So this is an ethyl substituent. Here, I have one carbon in the substituent right here, and the one carbon alkane is methane. To name that substituent, I'm gonna chop off the ane and call it il. So this is a methyl substituent. And you can see here in this table on the right, the various names that are used for linear substituents of various lengths. And again, after four carbons, it gets highly intuitive in terms of Greek prefixes with pencil for five, hexyl for six, heptyl for seven, that kind of thing. And, and the conventions you see on this slide are for linear substituents. When branching comes into play, things get a little more complicated.